Welcome back to PLS 510. <clears throat> this is going to be the third part of the four part series, if you, uh, on pasture management. <clears throat> and the four parts are uh, there'll be three on grazing management. The fourth one is the USDA graze tool. So, in a sense, this will be over our grazing management content. <clears throat> this will be the third um, lecture and the last. In, of the pasture management content. So I want to think about building a system. And efficient pasture systems are going to utilize <clears throat> rotational grazing. And to really do this well, or to make uh, this very organized and logical, I want to start defining a few terms. Uh, and these are terms that we have run across uh, already this semester. But uh, I want to take the time to define them now. First of all, animal unit month, AUM, stocking rate and stocking density. So let's take these one at a time. Animal unit month is the amount of forage needed to support a thousand pound beef cow and her calf for 30 days. And we roughly equate that to about 900 pounds. Sometimes we round it off to about a thousand, but anyway, it's about 900 pounds of dry matter or about 90% of her body weight. So one animal unit month is defined as about 900 pounds of dry matter. The stocking rate are, is calculated by uh, the number of animals, total number of animals on the total pasture land for a given period. So for the, in, it's the entire number of livestock and the entire land area. When we think of that uh, most of the time as full season, uh, we then call the full season stocking rates also called the carrying capacity. Stocking density, rather than being uh, for the entire pasture system, is the stocking rate on that sub part of the pasture system. So, uh, and I did say that right, it's the stocking rate on part of the pasture system. So stocking density is the, ro the ratio of animals to land area at a given moment on the paddock they are grazing. And with stocking density, we're usually thinking of a subdivided pasture system where all of the animals, or at least a group of animals, is on a part of the pasture system. So it's a snapshot in time and uses only the land base that cattle are on at that point in time. In other words, it's instantaneous. For example, if we have 40 cows weighing 1,400 pounds on a half acre strip, which is a lot of livestock on a half acre strip, let me tell you, um, that's 112,000 pounds of live weight per acre stocking density. Ordinarily, you would think of things between 15,000 to 20 or 30,000 or maybe more uh, as being a high stocking density. So having 40 cows that weigh this much on a half acre strip uh, is a tremendously high stocking density. And stocking density and the concept comes into play when we're talking about or trying to think about how much livestock is gonna be necessary to remove selectivity. In other words, if we want to uniformly harvest a forage uh, area, pasture area, and not let the animals be in charge, but we want to be in charge, you've got to increase the concentration of animals so that when they get on that pasture, they are thinking about eating and they're not thinking about whether it's the, the good, better, best bite they're about to take. They're going to consume uh, forage. So stocking density uh, is, again, that ratio of animals to land area at a given moment. Keys to efficient pasture systems typically have to do with fence and water, but there is one underlying assumption that I don't make a note of on this slide, but I want to do that because we will end up this lecture talking about stocking rate, overall stocking rate, or carrying capacity of the farm. That being able or finding out what your farm can carry and making sure that your livestock numbers are in that range is crucial to building an efficient and effective and a working pasture system, no matter what your fence and water systems are. If you are overstocked, then almost nothing you can do with fencing and watering is gonna make this work. 
So it mainly is you have uh, that an efficient pasture system has a, the underlying assumption, like in that web soil survey, that we have determined our carrying capacity, our animal unit carrying capacity, and we are within the bounds of our farm. So with a with fence, we're thinking of subdivided uh, using temporary or permanent fence to subdivide pasture, and then we are wanting to have water. Uh, within 800 feet of any point in pasture, uh, ideally. One of the things that people will, uh, I won't say get hung up on, uh, but that will question themselves about or question us about uh, when you say, I want to set up a, a rotational grazing system. And uh, they're going possibly from having just one or two pastures on the farm uh, and possibly no rotation at all to some rotation or to a more managed system, uh, how many subdivisions do you need? Well, you can calculate that and, and you can estimate that in a lot of different ways, but I wanna go this route. Uh, I uh, am a firm believer that forage systems are mathematical. Uh, and by the time we get through with this lecture, I think you will, uh, you, you will either agree with that or hate that, one of the two. But if you wanna calculate the paddock number, we can do so by knowing the days of rest that we need for a particular forage and the days of grazing, and then add one to that number. So let's calculate some. Think about our basics. Our forage growth tends to happen on 30 day cycles. So we want to be back on a pasture in 30 days. That means we give it 30 days of rest. So our days of rest on our, uh, for our pasture, we're gonna, we're calculating these paddock numbers it's going to be 30. Another th uh, basic about pasture management is, is that after seven days, livestock tend to regraze the same areas. So it, ideally, you'd want to keep your grazing period at seven days or less. And as a check or as a kind of a, you know, um, as you're setting this up and you're thinking about your days of grazing, is the number that you pick reasonable? In other words, are you willing to, to uh, rotate pastures uh, every three days, for example, or is every week more uh, of a reasonable number? So seven days is a reasonable number for this calculation. Rotating once a week is uh, going to work for our part-time uh, operations. So in this case, doing the math, the paddock number is days of rest, of, which is about 30, divided by the days of grazing at seven, which is roughly four, and then add one, and that comes up to be five paddocks. Now there's another way of estimating paddock number, and that's just looking at how much extra rest or how much pasture rest you get by adding another subdivision. So let's take a look at this table. If you have one paddock, in other words, you don't have any subdivisions, how much rest do you have? None. The livestock in that paddock have access to whatever they want. So uh, all the, the full time, the pasture is on duty all the time. If you uh, divide it in two pieces, then you can rest half of it at the same time. Three, you can rest two thirds or 67%. Four paddocks, you can rest 75% of the pasture. In other words, three out of four. Five, you, you rest four out of five or 80%. So you can see that you're, you're getting to a point of diminishing returns on percent rest, getting up to past four or five or six paddocks. So, uh, and quite frequently, or uh, that uh, we know that having or going beyond five, six, or say seven or eight paddocks is, is not necessary to gain more rest, but it is it may be necessary then to help you gain control of the forage in another way. So trying to gauge the amount of rest that uh, might be gained by pasture subdivision is also another way to estimate how many paddocks are gonna be necessary. So do we need a zillion paddocks? No, we don't. We just need to have enough paddocks to give us the rest that we need uh, and to keep our grazing periods short enough so that the animals do not regraze the same area, ideally. 
Every time I think about subdividing pastures, I think about a friend of mine in, at, uh, in Missouri, central Missouri, who uh, was very much into intensive grazing way back in the mid-1980s. And he had a, a 30 pasture system, 30 paddock system, uh, which was uh, very ahead of his time uh, for the mid-1980s. Uh, and one day I was out visiting with Ron and uh, we were talking about forages and uh, looked at his system. We were in it. And I said, well, Ron, where, where are the livestock? Because there was, there was not a, a steer, not a heifer, not a cow on the whole thing. And he said, oh, they're on the back of the farm on, the, on a tall fescue field. Why were they there? Well, because we were in a drought and the forage had stopped growing in that 30 pasture subdivision. 30 subdivided, uh, 30 paddocks uh, grazing system. And the take home message for me at the time is some, as when I, were, I mean, I was brand new and, and learning things is that you better have a place to go when the system, what doesn't work. Simply putting up fence doesn't grow more forage. And I'll make that point more than once during this lecture. Uh, and it's very important to know, um, you know, pasture rest will help grow more forage. Uh, fertilizing will grow more forage. Uh, leaving the right residual will grow more forage, but putting up fence doesn't grow more forage. So what's a sacrifice paddock? It's a paddock to go to when the system isn't working. Why do you need one? I can think of two examples uh, to maintain residual heights and prevent overgrazing. And uh, that was what Ron was doing uh, by moving them off of his 30 paddock system. Uh, but also in extra wet weather, we can uh, damage pastures, not from overgrazing, but because we compress and we, we mess up and we turn into a mud lot, uh, those pastures. And we know from history that uh, overgrazing a dry pasture is a lot less bad, a lot, lot uh, less damaging than overgrazing or poking up or pugging up a pasture during overly wet weather. I'd like to look at a few definitions again, just to uh, help us begin to visualize some of the systems that we might use uh, in grazing. This happens to be table number 29 from your forage pocket guide. Uh, it's also in uh, the appendix or in the rear of the uh, uh, Southern Forages book. So let's look at a few terms. The grazing method is that defined procedure uh, that we use to, to harvest the forage. And you could have uh, one or more grazing methods within a system. In other words, the farm may have, you may be doing a four paddock rotation over here, creep grazing over there, leader follower over here, uh, and more than one method can be used on a farm, of course, and it all together totals into this grazing system which is that integrated combination of animals and plants and soils and fence and subdivision and water and the whole thing uh, that you use to achieve your goals. Stockpiling forage like we do with tall fescue is to allow forage to accumulate for grazing at a later period. And this is typically a fall stockpile situation or fall, something we do in the fall and winter, but you can also stockpile forage in the summer and uh, use later. Continuous stocking is where the livestock have access to the, all of the pasture all the time. Creep grazing is where we allow juvenile animals to graze areas that their mothers cannot access at the same time. Here are a few more terms. Forward grazing, it's a method of utilizing two or more groups of animals usually that have different nutritional requirements to graze sequentially on the same land area. And there are some synonyms, leader follower, preference follower, top and bottom grazer, or first and last grazing. And we'll take a look at the visual representation of these in just a moment to help uh, give more context for these definitions. Forward creep is a method of creep grazing in which the mothers and the offspring rotate through a series of paddocks with the offspring as the first grazer and the mother as the second grazer or the last grazer. And this is a specific form 
of first and last phrasing. Of course, as uh, the contrast to continuous stocking or set stocking, we've got rotational stocking, and that's a grazing method that utilizes recurring periods of grazing and rest among two or more paddocks in a grazing management unit throughout the period when grazing is allowed. Set stocking is, is putting a fixed number of animals on a fixed area of land. And strip grazing is confining animals to an area of grazing land to be grazed in a relatively short period of time where the paddock size is varied to allow access to a specific land area. Usually the paddock size is varied to give uh, enough forage for a given period of time. So here are some graphical representations of some systems. Of course, continuous stocking, these two uh, and cows in this case, I'll, I'll say, have access to the whole pasture. So they have, it's all pasture all the time. And so that's continuous stocking. This is a variation that we use a lot in Kentucky. Continuous stocking with a fenced off area during surplus growth period. And that is a lot of times we will have uh, part of the farm fenced off for hay production. Uh, and then uh, we will we'll keep the, the cattle on just half of the land or two thirds of the land. And then we'll open up the whole area for them to graze. Then in the bottom left is the diagram of rotational stocking and that's the typical uh, ex, uh, system we think about or method that we, we think about, we've got a pasture area or a farm area uh, and we subdivide the, the forage area, uh, in this case into eight pieces, and we put the animals in each paddock and, and then graze throughout the system. Uh, and so then you get a sense too of stocking density. This has the same stocking rate and that this is the area of pasture that we have for the entire season but stocking density in this case is eight times the stocking rate because you've got uh, the stock dense stock the two cows if you want to think of it that way on one eighth of the pasture area and the last one on this page is strip grazing or strip stocking and that is where you're using temporary fence to allocate strips of forage, as the name would uh, suggest, uh, and then letting the animals sequentially move through. Again, I said a lot of times it's based on how long you want them to graze. Many times this is done with fall stockpiling tall fescue where you don't have to back fence. In other words, you don't have to, to, uh, to leave the fence up behind them and prevent them from uh, going backwards and maybe grazing this area like you might in a rotational stocking situation uh, and so the water can be here on the far left and then the first say the first week you allocate this strip and they graze it until you till the forage is gone and then you put up this wire and then drop this wire the animals move over and they graze this and of course they can go they can without the back fence they have access to this uh, to lie down on or uh, travel back and forth across uh, to get to the water and move through this sequentially. This is our second and our last page of grazing methods. Uh, remember we talked about creep grazing or creep stocking. Uh, this, in this case, we have created an area where the calves can get to that the, that the mothers cannot. Uh, and I think about uh, my work whenever I was at the University of Missouri, uh, and it would apply to any place where the land resource maybe uh, have a low pHs or low uh, fertility, and you just cannot afford to seed or reseed or put clover down or lime, you know, all the fertilizer needed for this whole pasture area. But if I wanted to get the biggest bang for my buck, then I could correct the, the soil pH and the fertility in a small area, get my clover established, and then only let the calves have access. And that lets me take this this small area and grow high quality forage that goes into these calves. And of course, we've talked about this before, that it's most efficient to put the to put high quality forage into animals that you're going to sell because you're going to get paid quicker for that. Uh, not that the cows do not need high quality forage, but this is one way to uh, target some resources. And I'm thinking of 
fertilizer and limestone in this case and clover seed uh, and then get uh, use your grazing method to make sure that it that you get that improved forage into the animals that need it the most i'm not going to talk much about sequence stocking and that's where you have either a hay feeding lot or low quality pasture over here and you let animals into the better pasture just a little bit uh, every day so it's like a mixed ration and I would say that this is a cattle option maybe a sheep and goat option but not a horse option because horses do not like to have a, a great change in the quality or quantity of their diet. On the lower left is forward stocking and that's the one where you had several synonyms, uh, forward grazing, uh, first and last stocking, top, top, uh, top and bottom grazers and things like that. But that's where the forage is grazed off in sequence by more than one group of animals that have different nutritional needs. So the first grazers get the most nutritional forage, the second grazers get the, lay, you know, this, the bottom half. So you move through a forage system that way. And uh, a type of forward stocking or forward grazing is forward creep stocking or forward creep grazing, where the uh, first animals through will be the calves with the higher nutritional uh, need. They'll get the better forage and their mothers come behind them then uh, and harvest the rest. As uh, I get to the latter part of this lecture, I want you to have a, the ability to calculate forage consumption uh, and determine reasonable stocking rates. In order to calculate forage consumption, we, we have to know a few things. We have to know the body weight of the animal. We have to know what percent of that body weight will that animal eat in, for, in terms of intake. And we have to know how much of the forage in front of them in the pasture will they eat. In other words, what percent utilization is a reasonable number for that uh, your scenario in the and your livestock and this system. We'll then take that number and compare that to the annual yield for that pasture as hay, and that will give us a realistic idea of grazing days or, or stocking rate or those sorts of things. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm doing this for a, a good reason. Um, the popular press, which um, does a good job of promoting the benefits of rotational grazing can sometimes, in my opinion, go a little overboard. Um, and this is what I mean. Uh, when I first started um, doing this sort of work, it was uh, there was a column and a writer at the time whose it seemed to be every column tended to say that if you will just rotationally graze, you can double your stocking rate. Well, I've already said earlier in this lecture that simply putting up more fence doesn't grow more forage. And so I wanted to, to kind of satisfy myself that I was not crazy, that, uh, you know, this, that you know, I thought it was a mathematical relationship uh, and that um, the, the cows need to eat or the horses need to eat what they need to eat and the, the forage pasture will produce what it will produce. And if you put those two things together, you should be able to figure out whether or not your stocking rate is correct or not. Now, this percent utilization can change. And we know that uh, many ways to increase the percent utilization uh, by uh, concentrating animals, stay leaving, on the leaving them on the pasture longer, uh, so, you know, having a, a shorter grazing periods so that they have uh, and a higher stocking rate so they have less uh, selectivity. You know, we can move that number up, but um, doubling the stocking rate, unless you were horridly under understocked before, is not going to work just by rotational grazing. So let's work through an example. Told you that we need to know these things, so we need to know the body weight and percent intake and the percent of the available forage that's consumed. In other words, the percent utilization. So let's take a 1,200 pound cow, consuming two and a half percent of her body weight in forage every day, and that winds up being 30 pounds of forage of dry matter per day, or roughly 900 pounds of forage of dry matter per month. And if we assume that whatever pasture we put in front of her, she will she can consume 50 percent 
uh, and that's the number that we want, that does require that, that we have 1,800 pounds of forage present in a pasture total per month in order to feed this cow. So let's keep moving. If we need 1,800 pounds per month and we have a nine month grazing season, that comes up to 16,200 pounds of forage dry matter for the grazing season or roughly eight tons. Now we need to think then how much forage will my land produce if it's producing uh, at maximum capacity. A really good pasture will produce about uh, four tons of dry matter per acre per year. So if we need eight tons and our every acre produces four tons, then we'll need two acres of pasture to support that 1,200 pound cow. And in, uh, in general, that's the minimum amount of land that it takes. Many times in order to raise the hay and to have some safety net, we're talking three and four acres uh, per cow or a cow-calf pair in order to, uh, ha to have a reasonable stocking rate. So I've already told you that uh, rotational grazing and stocking rate are related, but you cannot do as that writer said uh, when I, I referred to earlier, uh, just put up more fence and double your stocking rate. You may be able to do it for a while, but then you better be like my friend Ron in Missouri. You better have a sacrifice paddock or someplace to go when the system doesn't work because you're gonna run out of forage. So the benefits from a well-managed rotational pasture system with a realistic stocking rate are gonna be that the cattle eat more of what you grow, that's percent utilization. The forage is leafier, and that's gonna be that quality and quantity factor that we talk about or that goal that we want. Forages are gonna grow back faster and attain their yield potential. Uh, and they're gonna have greater persistence, uh, especially the upright forages like orchard grass, alfalfa, and the new fescues. So if you wanna just think about everything we've said so far about pasture management, uh, then you certainly need to have in your clear, mind, clear, uh, clear idea of your pasture management goals because those goals are gonna drive pasture decisions. We need to have an idea of our pasture infrastructure resources or the farm resources that we talked about. And remember, we talked about things like fence, uh, whether it's uh, uh, the permanent fence on the outside, the temporary subdivision fence, talked about water sources, whether they're permanent water, temporary water, whatever you it takes to, to get the water spread out across the system. Uh, we talked about other uh, resources like uh, uh, knowledge sources um, uh, and things like that uh, are gonna be important. The soil resource is gonna be important. All of those things are resources that define your capabilities and also then lead you to, to uh, pasture, making the right uh, pasture decision. And we need to think about the forage supply in order to, to uh, figure out both tonnage and then seasonality of supply so that we then uh, can take care of uh, supporting the livestock we have. And finally, the grazing system or grazing or how you put all these grazing methods together to harvest the forage uh, that you grow. Putting these together are gonna be uh, the way that we develop a sound pasture management system. Thank you.